and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. David Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new teen therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. David is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. Hello, Rhonda. Hello, David. <laughs> and welcome hello, in. Amy. <laughs> hello, everyone. <laughs> oh, hello, Amy, and welcome to episode 152. So today we have a, such an exciting podcast, and we're going to be talking about adolescent mental health with Amy Spector, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a credentialed school counselor. And she runs the mental health program at Vicente High School, which is a continuation high school in Martinez, California, and at Briani School, which is an independent study school also in Martinez. So Amy, tell us a little bit about what you do and how you incorporate team. Well, I love my job. I have the best job in the world working with at-risk youth. Um, and I started this program in Martinez working with these students. There really wasn't a lot of uh, mental health support before, and we got some grant funding and I was hired to provide this um, at this school, at these two schools. One is a continuation school, so this is for students who have failed out of a comprehensive high school and they come to us, so they're deficient in credits, but there's always a really good reason why they're deficient in credits, why they've failed classes. So we've um, found there's just a lot of trauma that's happened in their lives and they really need and utilize and love having counseling as part of their school day. And then the other school is, we're all housed under one roof, is an independent study school. So this is for students who want to take their coursework independently. And again, there's a lot of, a lot of these students suffer from anxiety, depression, and they just don't like being at a comprehensive high school with 1,200 other students. And so they really seek out the smaller alternative school environment. And again, they love having mental health as part of their school day. They love that they're able to access these services and get help that they need. So I have been using, I've been doing team therapy for a long time now. I don't even know how many years, at least six, seven years. I did, I started off doing um, an intensive with David and then just got hooked into the whole team therapy world, was in a consultation group with you, Rhonda, led by Phyllis Cedars for five years. And I really love integrating these concepts into a school setting. I think it's really um, just works so beautifully. So I do a lot with testing, for example. That's probably one of my favorite things. So doing testing with students, I do the brief mood survey at nearly every session with every student. And then I've used that data to support my program. So my position is grant funded, and that really helps me keep my job to say, look at these results I'm getting. I, I can show people that students are getting better, that they feel better after talking to a counselor. Whereas before it was just a warm, fuzzy feeling. Oh, I think they feel better. and. Look, they're, they seem happier, they seem lighter coming out, but I have actual data to, to show that. Yeah, and you were telling me um, about one student that, uh, you know, all of the professionals in his life felt he needed therapy, but you had his brief mood survey and had the results of that and used that for a clinical decision. Can you tell us that story? Well, yeah, so I, I do a lot. I work with all the students who have IEPs at my school. So those are individualized education plans. So any student who um, has counseling as part of their official IEP, they come and see me. And so I had a student who... You're going too fast for me with too many terms because I'm, I'm about at the fourth grade level here. Okay. <laughs> so what are, what are IEP or what, what, were, what are you referring to? A student came with some kind of initials? Yes, so a student came and they had to have counseling as part of their school program. Mm -hmm. We'll just put it that way. And um, he just, he felt better and, and he, but he still had the counseling as part of his school program. And so he didn't want to come anymore and he stopped coming to counseling. And so I was able to use brief mood survey data and I also did the Burns depression test with him and showed that he was no longer feeling depressed and we were able to justify him being exited from the counseling portion of his 
of his school program. Yeah, so I can imagine in another situation, he might have been determined like oppositional, like and forced to continue therapy when he didn't right. want to, and labeled all sorts of things. But instead, you could show him the brief mood survey and the results of the um, Burns depression scale and say, look, here are his results. He's saying that he's not depressed anymore. And so you have data in order to make a clinical decision. Yes, exactly. The data is so helpful to to be able to show what you're doing, why you're doing it, and that it works. What are, what are some of the things, the, the kinds of information you get from the brief mood survey in terms of depression, anxiety, suicidal urges, anger? I don't know if you use the relationship satisfaction scale, the positive emotion scale. We have a new happiness, a brief mood survey with a ha- okay. short happiness scale. A oh, five great. item. Oh, I'm going to have to add that uh, out. But what, yeah. and, and then the, the empathy uh, ratings after the session, the helpfulness mm-hmm. ratings, what, what kind of numbers do you, do you see and what kind of information does this give you? Well, I did a, a deep analysis um, about a year ago. I took a year and a half worth of data. I went through every single brief mood survey I had done and I looked at the general trend of the befores and the afters. And my... I found about 60% reduction in depression, 65% Is reduction that in, a single session? in anxiety. Yes, so those were single session. So numbers. you're averaging a 60% decrease in depression in one session? In one session, which is often half an hour in my school setting. Yeah, and now I think before we go on, we should emphasize that, that a little bit. I call that recovery coefficient. Mm, mm-hmm. uh, to, to what extent can, can a therapist achieve actual change with with patients and I've often said when I was a psychiatric resident we never measured anything and the assumption was that change would take months or years that we weren't expecting to see anything in the near future and that became a self-fulfilling prophecy mm-hmm. and and so a lot of listeners will be skeptical that you're saying you can take <laughs> at risk Adolescents, of course, they're the most motivated and cooperative. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and, yeah. and, and, and cause in, in one brief therapy session, a 60% reduction in, in depression. And Sonny Choi, who I don't think you know him, but he's going to talk at the, in, the intensive next week here at the South San Francisco Conference Center, works with immigrants and people who often can't speak English and have very few resources. Mm -hmm. And he also has 40-minute sessions, 35-minute sessions. And he also sees most of his patients recover in three or four sessions. And I think it's to a lot of listeners who are used to, you know, you saw the movie Good Will Hunting. Mm -hmm. That was like an at-risk adolescent. And, you know, he's hanging out with his therapist for for months and months and nothing changes and finally the heavens open up and they hug each other and cry. (laughs) But it's supposed to take a very long time and and so a lot of listeners will be skeptical that you could... In fact, they may be thinking, oh, the students are just conning you because they don't Mm want to be in in, in, in therapy. They're not really, really getting better. How how would you address that? Of course, I'm I mean, your camp, I know these changes are real, but uh, Mm -hmm. address that a little bit. Well, I would say that um, to address the students conning you, they're they're very honest. So I will say... Too honest. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They're brutally honest. So I have not not had the experience of somebody just telling me what I want to hear or writing something down on a paper to get out of it. Um, In general, they love coming to therapy. The ones that love coming to therapy love coming. And even if they're feeling better, they'll come and we'll do something else. We're not necessarily, you know, working on therapy every week. I have a mentor relationship with them as well because they're really benefiting from spending time with um, an adult who cares about them and is helping them with their life. So they may work on their depression one session and then come the next session and play Uno. And that's totally beneficial as well. Yes, I like your approach of being unstructured and not 
following strict formulas. I, I haven't been in private practice for 25 years, but I still treat people all the time. I treat everyone for free. I guess you do too. I do. Mm -hmm. And it gives you a kind of freedom. But I'm always doing new and different things. Like mm -hmm. I'll have a two-hour session with someone, or I had a session with someone the other day. He was thinking he, he wasn't good enough uh, as, a, as a husband, as a father, mm -hmm. and we were doing externalization of voices, help, helping him smash the, those thoughts. And he got about, I'd say, 80% uh, improvement uh, and, and almost completely saw that those were false thoughts. Mm -hmm. And the reason he said he wasn't good enough is because he thought he wasn't making enough money. And he doesn't make a lot of money. His business, he's in, there's for whatever reason, beyond his control, really. He relies on, on Google to bring people to his website, and then they change their search rules. Mm. So his traffic went way down, so he's not making a ton of money right now. And he had 20 years of abuse growing up, mm. uh, r real severe. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think he struggled a lot with moods, and so his other reason that he's not good enough as a father and as a husband is he's low on, on confidence. So he thinks, well, a, a man, a father, is supposed to be, make a lot of money and be high on confidence. Mm -hmm. So he kind of got over that connection, uh, but it wasn't like total crushing it, you know, going into full, full enlightenment. And then I woke up at four in the morning and I realized a different method I could use to make him see that. Mm. So I rushed down here to my computer and emailed him. He's on the East Coast, so, you know, he was probably just getting up and I said, call me as soon as you can. I, I have this cool thing I want to do. And then, he, you know, he, shortly later he, he called me. And then we, we recorded it and, and I did this other technique and then he went into kind of full-blown enlightenment. But it's, it's, it's also like not following the rules mm -hmm. of, of how, you know, this one hour once a week Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't really make any logical logical sense. I'm, I'm excited yeah. to see you. You're also experimental and creative. Very much. Yeah. Very much. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you really have to meet your client where they're at and help them with the tools you have, but also with what they're willing to do and what their, yeah. what, you know, what, what path they're on and what makes sense to them. You know, it doesn't always, yeah, we, we might have a great idea of, you know, oh, this makes intellectual sense to me. I can explain it to you and you're going to yeah. feel better. And then it just goes right over their head. So you yes, have to be right. flexible and fail yeah. as fast as you can yeah. And, yeah. and have more tricks up your sleeve so you can keep trying. How, how severe is the depression and anxiety you see? What are some of the numbers or the numbers on the anger scale or the suicide scale or... Um, so we, I, I've seen some 20s up there. Um, For probably, our listeners, a 20 is the most severe a human being can have. It's yeah. Most people who are hospitalized for depression wouldn't even have a 20. Yeah, yeah. Um, we see a lot of, um, probably more in the 7 to 10 range is more the daily. Yeah. What I, you know, what and I like see on a daily basis. Chronic depression called dysthymic disorder. Right. Which doesn't exist, but psychiatrists have to have big words to <laughs> pretend they know something that other people don't know. That's right. Okay. Cool. Like an ongoing semi-mild yeah. depression. Yes. Well, and Mild to moderate. I also use um, the ACEs survey, so that's um, Adverse Childhood Experiences. So mm -hmm. that looks at the number of traumatic events that have happened to someone before the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And that's on a 0 to 10 scale. And there's been a ton of research with that, looking at long-term health and mental health effects of that. And basically the higher the number, the higher every adverse event oh, really? in your mm -hmm. life. So if you have you know, uh, anything above a six, you have a 20 year reduction in lifespan, um, higher risk of things like lung disease, heart disease, oh. obviously mental health issues. So uh, it's, I think it's like a 1200% increase in suicide. So I did that with my students, and the average score was six on that. So they're yeah. very high on traumatic experiences, and then they tend to score pretty high in the beginning on the brief mood survey. So you're saying that? As well. Let's make this point clear here: that uh, bad teenagers, 
in other words, <laughs> ones that society would say these are troublemakers and they're flunking out of high school and they've had severe trauma and they have moderate to severe to extremely elevated uh, depression and anxiety and anger and, and so forth can be treated easily and quickly. Now that, that, that's really, really important data and information in, in, my, in my opinion uh, because, and I think one of the things you advocate for uh, politically is, is to get more mental health training into high schools. Mm -hmm. When my daughter was a high school freshman, I, I worked with her a lot on just simple things like how to flirt, how to wrap boys around your finger, you know, <laughs> how, how to, you know, win the dating game, mm -hmm. so to speak. And, and she just picked up on it so fast and it was so gratifying and it was really kind of a life changing thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and, and yet, as you point out, there, there isn't a lot of mental health training in high schools, and, and yet when, when kids are in that age, I think they're the most suggestible, the most open, the, mo the most responsive. Absolutely. They're re they really want this information, and if it's not coming from a sane, trained adult, they're getting it from their peers. <laughs> so yeah. that's your option. Either you provide it in schools with someone <laughs> who can help them, or they're going to get it from each other, and the results may vary on that. And what you're talking about is really counterintuitive. You're talking about kids who are really high risk, mm -hmm. and um, in a half hour, the average depression scale goes down 60%, mm -hmm. depression and anxiety. So can you tell us a little bit about how that, what you do in that half hour? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Well, it's a lot. I just slap them around and say, yeah. change your scores on this test or you're, yeah, exactly. you're going to be sorry. Oh <laughs> I, just fell, oh, I just fell out the after column for those. That's yeah. <laughs> what you're supposed to do. I'm surprised you, it's you were not thinking of 80, better. but you thought yeah. no one would believe 80. So you... Yeah, exactly. So I, went with, I went with a believable number. Yeah. <laughs> Well, again, it's very individual, and I like to be creative and flexible, um, yeah. so it really depends. But we always start with the testing, and then that gives me, that allows me to work with somebody in half an hour. Honestly, having a brief mood survey in front of me, I can say, wow, I see your depression score is really elevated today. What What's going on? And then yeah. we dive right in, so we, we get started right away. We don't. That's what Sonny does, too. So yeah. he doesn't do an intake evaluation. I was always mm -hmm. trying, you have to spend two hours going through all of this history and everything. No, never, he yeah. dives right in. That's what I do on the Sunday hikes also. And right. in the Tuesday groups when I'm doing live work with therapists, let, let, let's, let's go for it right now. Right. Make it happen now. That's cool. What yeah. kind of things do they have? What are their negative thoughts like? What techniques do you use? Well, so a lot, I do a lot with empathy. I find that gets you so far. Um, just having somebody listen to you and um, even thought empathy. It's amazing how little we have that in our lives. Yeah. So a little bit of thought empathy. Now, what is thought just... empathy for our listeners who, like me, are at the fourth grade level? What, <laughs> what, what is thought empathy? What is feeling empathy? Well, thought and feeling empathy are, are simply reflecting back, saying back what somebody said and how I they know, I created the term. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm in a facetious mood, but yes, thought empathy. You repeat the person's words, and 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 that's incredibly helpful to to people because they know an adult is listening and, and got it. What what would feeling empathy be? Well, feeling empathy is then just simply reflecting back what they've told you they feel or what you imagine they might yeah. be feeling given what they've just told you. Do you use all of the five secrets of effective communication? Absolutely. Yeah. And not only do I use it, but I teach that to my students and I try to teach it as often as I can to parents as well because I find it to be so, so helpful. That, you know, And all the students I've worked with, they will often tell me they want a better relationship with their parents, but they're not going to their parents and saying that to their parents. Yeah. It's all, F you, I hate you. Yeah, yeah, right. why, why did you bring me into this world? Right. But then they come to me and they say, I'm really sad I'm not closer to my parents. So we will go, we'll go through, I call them a texting autopsy. 
and they'll show me their text messages. They'll say, I just got in a huge fight with my mom. Okay, yeah. show me the text. We'll go through the text and then we'll kind of do a relationship journal using their text messages. So yeah, cool. how do you, okay, what, what, what did you say there? What do you, what do you think you could say? What if you were going to, if yeah. you did thought empathy there, what would that sound like? What would that look like? And I'll come up with my version and then they'll be, I would never say that. Here's yeah. how I would say, you know. Well, you're really lucky to be working with this, this population. And when I was in practice, I was mainly an adult shrink, but from time to time people would send their, uh, kid to, to me, a teenager or something, and it was just always so much fun. So we were talking about what you do in the half hour with oh, yeah. the students, some of your negative thoughts, and you know, the, one of the reasons I wanted you to come on the podcast, Amy, because you're so creative in how you utilize the, you know, the entire team structure, so I'd love for you to tell us some case studies and some things that you've done and, and you know, how you've gotten the great results that you have. Well, I think one of the key things is paradoxical agenda setting. So that's um, really diving into why somebody might want to keep their negative thoughts, their negative feelings. Um, So I have a, a really great student that I worked with and he was an amazing artist. And so we, he had a lot of anxiety. And so we, we went into the paradoxical agenda setting and we were talking about all the wonderful things about anxiety. And, um, and he decided to draw a cartoon character. So he did Anxiety Man and he had a cape and he saved the day because he, all of his anxiety was helping people. You know, he could save people from going out in the world and getting hurt. And, and Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. So he, it was all he drew the, the paradoxical. He drew it out. It was beautiful. And then we looked at the positives, uh, the negatives of, of being calm. And really, if you're too calm, I can't remember what the character is called, maybe like Mr. Chillman or something. So Mr. Chillman was so relaxed, like he would get hit by a bus because he just didn't care. You know, he'd just walk into the street, you know, so there are really a lot of bad things about being too relaxed. And so a little, you know, and so then we were able to look at dialing down the anxiety. Well, maybe you don't want all of it. Maybe you could just keep a little bit of it because it really does a lot of really great things. So he ended up just feeling so excited about having anxiety like oh this is a great thing you know? yeah. wow, I'm, so, I'm so blessed i love How my anxiety now. I am, right? Right. yeah me <laughs> that's so it must excite you just tremendously to make these fast breakthroughs with with, with people oh it's it's such a joy yeah. I mean, like you were always saying it's such a joy to be able to work with someone and to be watching them embrace something that's been plaguing them and that they've hated about themselves and that's really caused not just whatever distress from anxiety but also this kind of blow to how they think about themselves because they're they're bad or they're you know not as good, mentally yeah. healthy as everybody else and then they can see themselves in this new light and it's just amazing it's fun to see that that works for teenagers it's it's not surprising but it's it's really cool and i imagine it would work for children too. We'll have to get Taylor back on the show, uh, who works uh, for Taylor Chesney in New York, works with even little kids with, mm-hmm. with team. But I think you'd have to go even further in the direction that you're going of, of making it a fun thing mm-hmm. to, to, to learn these, these techniques. When I was, as opposed to the way we might do it with, with adults, when uh, my hospital in Philadelphia, we, at, at, at in those days, I was still thinking of it as cognitive therapy. The team is, as you know, much more sophisticated than that. But it was like the early pro- prototype of of team therapy. And one of our uh, therapists was an African American social worker named George Collette, who loved to go to nightclubs where there were comedians and stuff. And he, he loved games. And so he created for our schizo- schizophrenia unit, the inpatient, a game version of cognitive therapy. And he, he created about 30 games that you can play. Mm-hmm. And they would just have the patients on, the, on that inpatient unit just playing these cognitive therapy games all day to, to, to get the, the point. And, and, and that's just be, because they have a short attention span. They're, they're, they're hallucinating like just one of them I'll just be really quick but I mean you, you could also do this with teenagers as well as little little kids like one was called the pepper shaker game 
And, and so the patients would come into this you know, room where they had the groups and he would say, there, there's a pepper shaker hidden in plain sight here in the room and, and see if you can find it. But when you see it, uh, don't let on where you saw it. Then you go back and, and sit down, but notice what you're thinking and feeling while you're looking for the pepper shaker and, and afterwards. So all the patients get up and they look around. Maybe it's sitting above the, the you know, the exit thing near, near the door. And you, if you look there, you'll, you'll see this, this pepper shaker. And so all the patients, they wander around, then they all sit down. They've all found the pe- pepper shaker and says, now, what, what were you feeling d- during this? And then like one paranoid patient might say, oh, well, I, I was angry. And, and, well, what were you telling yourself? Well, I was thinking that you're trying to fool us, and there is no pepper shaker. Mm-hmm. And then another one said, well, I felt really anxious. And then what were you thinking? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I'll be the last to find it. I, you know, I'm always, I'm not good enough. And then another one, how were you feeling? Oh, I felt really happy when I saw it. I thought, oh, my gosh, this is awesome. You know, I'm, I'm worthwhile. <laughs> and so th- and then he's just putting this on a, on a whiteboard and just emotion and thought. And then... The idea here, you're all doing exactly the same thing. You're having different emotions, and your emotions are constantly changing because your thoughts are changing. And just mm-hmm. like a real simple way of making making that point. And then there were a lot of these other games as well. That's why I, I love what you're yeah. doing because it, you're saying it can be creative. Therapy doesn't have mm-hmm. to be some rigid, r- rigid thing. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I play Five Secrets Uno with my students. Oh all yeah, the time. Uh, yes. how, how does that how does that one work? So, Five Secrets Uno, you just pick a color or number, and then you pick one of the secrets you want to work on. And every time somebody plays that color or number, you you integrate that secret in. So maybe it's blue four, and anytime somebody plays that, then you have to do thought empathy. Oh. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. So it's a fun way to practice it. You know, you're Maybe we should use game. that in the Tuesday group. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <It's> really, <laughs> I have it in a set. Yeah. yeah. Um, and actually with my colleague, Brandon Vance, we actually created a therapy game called Tune In, Tune Up. And that oh, wow. integrates some five secrets as well. So this has relationship skill building and instead of you know we, I was I have the ungame in my office so that's a popular one it just is a, a prompt so talk about your favorite tv show and and then you know you can talk about that but but it doesn't teach you communication skills so we integrate it in teaching the five secrets so you'll so the person to your left will talk about their favorite tv show and then you have to state back what they said and how they might be feeling. Oh, about yeah, it. nice. Yeah, so, really then, a kind of a safe way to, to introduce the concepts. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to the heavy way we do it. Yeah, right. Group, <laughs> yeah. But, you know. And a fun way to practice without any pressure or mm-hmm. anxiety building. Like, I have to get it right because it's just so fun. Yes, yeah, exactly. And then there's, you know, some goofy stuff in there as well. So it's not all. If some of our listeners, um, probably a lot of them are, are working with kids and would be just mm-hmm. interested in what you're, you're saying or have kids or are kids or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if, if they wanted to contact you to learn more mm-hmm. about this, can, can we put your, well, you can announce Absolutely. your email address and we'll yes. put it in the show notes, but most people yeah. don't get the show notes. But if someone okay. wanted to contact you to get this, this game yeah. called uh, Tune, Tune in, to tune up. That that mm-hmm. sounds cool. Because uh, yeah. uh, I know Brandon, and mm-hmm. anything that you and Brandon created would have to be be awesome. How would they? How would the listeners contact you? Well, my email is babyfreud at gmail dot com. Baby so they Freud. can, <laughs> they can uh, contact me through that, um, and then we'll put the the link in the show notes. And our games available on gamefulmind dot com. I once wanna, uh, created a toy for children, but I couldn't get any of the toy companies to build it, but it was going to be a robot that would teach the ten secrets of effect, the five yeah. secrets of effective <laughs> communication. And I, I, I proposed calling it Friendly Freud. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, it's funny. Nobody knows who Freud is anymore, so I'll go to a store, you know, you give your email well, I feel less the bad because a lot of people don't know who I am. I'm, 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 I'm going over the hill. but no I, chance <laughs> if they don't know who Freud is. <laughs> So they'll say, what, baby fraud? That's your email? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, I mean, do you also work with your students' parents? 
I do. And tell us how you do that. Yes. Well, I, again, a lot. I just feel like the five secrets are magic with adolescents. And yeah, they are. <laughs> especially the disarms. So. Because you had started talking about students want to have a better relationship with their parents, but then they're going home and saying F you to their parents. So how do you, <laughs> <laughs> how do you bridge that? Um, so you bridge that with the disarm. So teaching a parent to be non-defensive, non-reactive, and to just go with what their kid is saying, I think, is it just get you again 80% of the way there. If if your kid comes to you, your teen says F you and you can say, you know, boy, you're absolutely right. I am such an ass and I can, I can absolutely see why you're mad at me and yeah. I did the following things wrong, you know, cuz as a parent you're always screwing up. So, <laughs> so, so it's easy to sit. <laughs> exactly, it's easy to admit that. But do you, but do you ever work with someone's outcome resistance so they may not really want to be close to their parent or the parent may not really want to be close to their child? And just tell us, what is outcome resistance? Because I'm still at that fourth grade level. <laughs> <laughs> it's when a person doesn't really want what they're coming in to say that they're working on. So like example, the parent may not want to be close with their child. even though the, Or vice versa. Or the child might not want to be close, but they come in because they feel obligated to say that. Right. Um, yeah. So I do, I would say more so with the teens that, um, you know, I always do that as part of the agenda setting too. Like, wow, it's so unfair. You'd have to do all the work and your parent just sounds like a piece of work. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. how, you know, they're, yeah, they're not yeah, right. here. Maybe we can get them in for one session. Maybe not. You know, it's, it's not that frequent that I'm working with the parents. So, so they, they're going to have to really put in the work and effort and, so- so let me see if I understand you, because this mm-hmm. sounds kind of radical and dangerous. <laughs> Instead of <laughs> trying to tell the teenager what to do, which has, uh, they've done a recent study of that, and they found that they actually have every time a parent has tried that for the past 2,800 years, the American uh, Journal of Psychiatry will have an article on this that next yeah. week, and it's a 100% failure rate. 100% failure. And so you're trying to persuade the child that it's going to be a lot of work, mm-hmm. and maybe this isn't such a good idea to try to right. get close to your parents. Now, why would mm-hmm. you do that? You sound like the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I do that because of outcome resistance. So if somebody doesn't actually want to do something, I can't make it happen. I mean, I wish I could. I'd be a bazillionaire by now if I could make people do stuff. That would be amazing. So you side with their resistance. Absolutely. And that's a way of honoring them and and, and showing that that you care about them and, and that you're there for them and to be with them rather than to try to be some expert who, who's going to tell them what right. to do. And this is such a hard principle for parents to learn and therapists. Mm-hmm. Most therapists can't learn it either because they're so committed to trying to be experts and trying to, as we've seen recently, cheer patients up and you know tell them mm-hmm. tell them how they should how they should change. I have one little story I'm debating about telling because our time is, is almost up and what you're saying is so fantastic. <laughs> but uh, I, should I throw in my own? Yeah, it's been 30 minutes, so I think we have time. Uh, okay, I'll try to make it quick. The California Juvenile Department, the probation officers or whatever, asked me to give my brief mood survey to uh, I think more than 200 of the students, who, the kids who had been arrested and were in probation halls, and then they wanted me to report to them how, how suicidal are they, how angry, how, how depressed, you know, similar to, to what you're doing. And then they asked me to go and talk to some of the kids in San Mateo who are actually incarcerated and waiting trial. And first they had me, t- because they wanted to see how, how do they think about these tests and what what are, what are their thoughts about violence and things like that? And first, they had me talk to five gang members who were all girls, and I thought they'd be you know real hardcore, and and they were just so tender and grateful to have an adult to to talk to. It was just practically brought tears to my eyes, and they just opened up. And then, after about fifty minutes, one of the Officers there, and he says, well, doctor, you have to finish up now because Dr. Burns has to go and talk to the boys in, in five minutes. And all of a sudden, the, the girl stopped t- talking t- to me, and I, I couldn't get another word out, out of them. And, and then when we went off, I was just kind of hanging my head and feeling really bad. And I said to the, uh, to the police officer, whatever 
probation officer, whatever person was, I said, you know, something happened there and I, I, I must have said the wrong thing or something because they, they were all open and then they, it's like someone turned the faucet off. He says, no, what happened is, is that they're, they're so used to being abandoned and they were just starting mm -hmm. to trust you and then they found out they're going to get abandoned again and, mm -hmm. and that, that hurt them. Uh, and then I sat down with the boys and there were about six of them including a couple who had murdered people. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to them and they opened up. But this one boy, uh, Billy, wouldn't, wouldn't say anything. And I said, Billy, I, I, I noticed that uh, you're not saying anything. And all the other boys are just really, really opening up. And, and uh, you know, what, what, what's going on or what, what are you thinking? He says, well, you want to know why I won't talk to you, Doc? I said, yeah, Billy, I'd, I'd love to know. He says, well, I'll tell you why. You came over here this morning from your fancy dancy Stanford University, and you had a fantasy that you were going to find out all about teenage violence from us. And then you're going to write an article, and it's going to, you'll be featured in Time magazine. And you were all excited about that. And... Uh, and the fact is, Doc, you're, you're exploiting us right now, and you ain't going to give us nothing. So why the hell should I talk to you? And it was so embarrassing because I'd had that fantasy when I was driving over there and <laughs> saying, oh, I'm going to find out some awesome thing, and I'll get a new theory about teenage, teenage violence. I felt really uh, ashamed, and, uh, and then I thought, well, David, are you going to follow, practice what you preach or not, and are you going to use the five secrets and so I said, I'll just take a chance on it. I said, you know, Billy, I'm, I'm just feeling so embarrassed and ashamed right now because uh, I did have that fantasy. And I never thought of it the way you're putting it. But the fact is I am exploiting you kids for my own ego. And, and I'm not really giving you anything. And you have every right to be really pissed off and angry and you know, I have to feel plead plead guilty as as accused. Mm -hmm. And then he just suddenly opened up like a flower, and they all opened up. It was just a fantastic exchange. But it it, it was just so so neat to be able to to use the five secrets. He was being awfully open and and real. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's one of the neat things about about working with teenagers and, mm -hmm. and kids. But they're going to test you. Mm -hmm. And if you don't pass the test, as the Buddha said right. so many years ago, if you don't pass that test, you're screwed. Absolutely. Exactly. That was an attempt at humor. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, though. Yeah. yeah. I think it's that magic combination of the disarm yeah. and not trying to help somebody. Yeah, right. So, so you, yeah, it's fant it's a yeah. fantastic. It's, it's like a, a martini or something. Exactly. <laughs> it's a, a combination of pot and a martini or something. Yeah. <laughs> and it's very heady, but it's awful hard for parents to learn. It's awful hard for, for therapists to learn. Right. Yes, absolutely. Well, there are some incredibly, uh, one or two incredibly important closing remarks uh, that are going to be awesome. <laughs> and the, uh, the Rhonda will now <laughs> say what they are. <laughs> well, you know, I've known Amy for a long time. And I've listened to how you have incorporated all of the team structure and the methods into this population that I think a lot of people would say are difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. And you've had amazing results with the teens that you work with. Mm -hmm. And not only that, but you've had amazing results when you've gone to Sacramento asking for funding or where you've gone to your private sources asking for funding because you've been able to collect this testing data. So, you know, with the balance of collecting the testing data and, and incorporating all of the team structure into what you're doing, you're doing such a great job. And I'm just so proud of you. And really, I just am so happy to share what the work that you do with everyone. Well, I'm proud of you, too. And I'm just so excited because you're just like popcorn that's popping, you know. <laughs> and and I, I hope many more people that we've been training yeah. will, will kind of catch the flu that we all <laughs> right. have or whatever, get infected with this because you're really uh, more than a therapist. You're, you're really kind of a healer in, in a way. A hundred percent. I'm actually trying to encourage Amy to start a consultation group for other 
<laughs> school psychologists who want to practice the type of team therapy that she does. And so maybe... And online, yeah, that online, would be yeah. great, great. And so, uh, if, if you are a school psychologist or a teacher and you'd be interested in that, again, uh, email a Amy and maybe you, could, you can get a, you know, a two-hour weekly training, training course for people who want to learn how to do what you're doing in such an awesome mm -hmm. way. And again, your email is baby fraud. <laughs> what, what's your email baby freud at <laughs> gmail at gmail.com great and uh, calm that's c-a-l-m absolutely <laughs> absolutely <laughs> great thank you so much thanks amy thank you this has been another episode of the feeling good podcast for more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes for this episode under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non-therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. The theme music is Gypsy Jazz in Paris, 1935, composed and performed by Brett Van Donzel. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.